this latest stream of project video videos by Fair Mormon are well quite disturbing to be honest because they're clearly an attempt to appeal to a younger audience to try and control the narrative at a younger age um late teens into what i say but the problem is they're using several logical fallacies to try and make these points and arguments and to try and discredit the ces letter now it's quite interesting that they've brought the ces letter to everyone's attention by doing these videos but that's kind of a different point so I'm going to look through this and see if I can spot some of those logical fallacies and make a point of you know, sharing them with you so you can see. And um, I may not rebut every point. They may land some valid ones, which, you know, there will be truth within some of this. Uh, but with all that said, let's go on with it. Welcome back to This Is The Show. This one's going to be controversial, so let's jump in. The CES letter states that Joseph Smith was married to 34 women. Yes, it does. Um, <clears throat> just want to get this out there right off the bat. Family Search also confirms this. Joseph Smith's profile has him listed as 31 women. Um, and the church's plural marriage in Nauvoo and Kirtland SA also has it listed at 33. So without getting into the minutia, it's definitely over 30 as marriages. However, it doesn't make a distinction between marriage and ceilings. Neither does the Family Search profile. Um, so what's your point? If the picture in your head is Joseph Smith fooling around with a bunch of women, you're wrong. That's not Joseph Smith. It's Jason Derulo. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. That's the song he sings. According to church doctrine, sealing is when two people are spiritually partnered together for the next life. Most marriages are sealed for time, meaning this life, and eternity, meaning the next life. But not all of Joseph's ceilings were for time and eternity. Many were just for eternity. Yeah, but even if only some were, then he was still practicing polygamy, which means later in his life he still lied about polygamy when he had publicly sworn affidavits saying that he didn't practice polygamy when he clearly was. So it only had to be like one more than Emma and he's practicing polygamy. Sealing is usually synonymous with marriage, but that shouldn't always be so. For example, children are sealed to their parents. Yes, children are sealed to their parents. So if Joseph wanted to be sealed to some of these minors, which I hope we're going to get into later, then um, why not be sealed to them as daughters or something if sealing is, isn't just about marriage? The sealing power is about binding humanity together for the next life. When this is your goal and the doctrine is being restored, it isn't unreasonable that polygamy would come into effect. No, it isn't unreasonable that polygamy would come into effect because um, it came into effect when Joseph asked about it, he asked God um, what was going on with you know, David and Solomon and their concubines, I believe it was. And um, DNC 132 is the answer to that question. God gave a very clear set of instructions as to how polygamy was to move forward. So no, it's not surprising at all. Now, the CES letter also claims that while Apostle Orson Hyde was on a mission, Joseph Smith married his wife, Marinda. However, John D. Lee records that Orson gave permission. When he returned from... Right, so he gave permission. That doesn't mean it's okay or not, right? From his mission, Orson himself was sealed to another woman. It doesn't seem that he was upset by Joseph and Marinda's sealing. Again, However, in 1846, right. Marinda was then sealed to Orson Hyde for eternity. This complicated narrative suggests that the early view of sealing isn't completely understood yet. The, uh, the early view of sealing is very well understood. It's laid out in scripture, as I've said. Particularly DNC 132, it's, it's labeled in the heading of that scripture. As, chapter, as verses 58 to 66 is labeled as the laws governing plural marriage are set forth. So unless the early members weren't playing by their own God-given rule book, the rules were very clear. The understanding was clear. The ES letter's flippant attempt to pawn it off as purely sexual is misleading. The It's not the CES letter that claims that polygamy was purely sexual. That's a straw man. It doesn't do that. But DNC 132 does. It says, and I'll quote this, for they, meaning the virgins referred to in earlier verses, are given unto him to multiply and replenish the earth according to my commandment to fulfill the promise which was given by my father before the foundations of the world and for the exaltation in the eternal worlds that they may bear the souls of men. It's for, it's for having children. It's sexual. Reality is, there are too many variables to claim that this was practiced just for sex. If you want to have sex, you don't start a religion. You get an Airbnb in Seattle. What? <sighs> no, Kwaku, if you're a good Mormon and you want to have sex, you get married. You don't go to some seedy Airbnb. What is this joke about? I mean, it's absurd. We know of several examples of sex cults. They exist. It's a well-known phenomenon. People start religions to get sex. 
it's uh, oh, it's a it's a pointless argument. Why would you know? That? Ah, you don't have any evidence. Oh, well, speaking of, there is zero evidence that Joseph had a sexual or romantic relationship with Marinda. The letter but he also been quoted church historian Marlon K. Jensen and Fair Mormon out of context. The letter goes on to say this: the church and a Paul. Right, sorry to hammer this home here, but I want to stop this because I assume they're probably not going to leave it up the whole time. The church and apologists now attempt to justify these polyandrous marriages by theorizing that they probably didn't include sexual relations and thus were eternal or dynastic ceilings only. How is not having sex with a living man's wife on earth only to take her away from him in the eternities to be one of your, Joseph's, 40 wives any better or any less immoral? That's a very good point, and I'm sorry to keep hammering this home. The attempts to muddy the waters by saying some ceilings were for time and others were for time and eternity, uh, some were just for eternity, etc., etc. It's in direct contradiction to Joseph's commandment to bear the seed of men, to to bear the souls of men in um, bodies. It's in direct contradiction to that. People just now attempt to justify these polyandrous marriages by theorizing that they probably didn't include sexual relations and thus were eternal or dynastic ceilings only. How is not having sex with a living man's wife on earth only to take her away from him in the eternities to be one of your 40 wives any better or less immoral? I'm sorry, is this meant to be apologetics or or like a point scoring thing? I, I don't get what's going on here. Well, the ironic thing is the CES letter is atheistic and against the idea... Hang on. So his rebuttal to Jeremy's point there is that he's an atheist. He's just attacking his worldview. The idea of God in general. If there's no God, then marriage is just a societal construct. Sexual ethics are based on subjective views, and there's actually nothing immoral about polygamy at all. If people are consenting, that's all that matters. If there's no objective truth rooted in a higher power, then Jeremy Runnell's objection to polygamy is based solely on his own opinion and in an atheistic society in which subjective views are all that matter, it would be inappropriate of him to push his marriage opinions onto others. No, because there are arguments against polygamy which don't rest on a supreme being. And the fact that human beings have uh, a perennial sex drive rather than annual mating seasons. They have offspring that need support of both parents for a long time compared to other animals. And whilst women naturally bond with their children, men only bond with their children if there's certainty of paternality. Is this, to quote, exclusive and enduring monogamous unions are thus the fitting way that humans can at once have regular sex, paternal certainty, and mutual caretaking of their young children. Humans have learned by natural inclination and hard experience that monogamy best accords with human needs. So it doesn't have to be a religious argument for polygamy. You can't make that false binary and say, well, if there's no God, there's no argument against polygamy, because there are some natural arguments. Basically, if there is no God, any argument against polygamy is pointless and subjective. Nah. Who cares what Jeremy Reynolds thinks? As long as consent exists, polygamy is fine. The CES letter questions why Heber C. Kimball saw the proposition of his wife, Violet, marrying Joseph as an Abrahamic test if there was no sex involved. Well, Jim Bennett says it best. Because the test clearly involved a proposal that wasn't for that kind of ceiling, Heber C. Kimball calls this an Abrahamic test. That's significant, as it is compelling evidence that Joseph recognized genuine polyandry as being transgressive of the plural marriage revelation. The CES letter states that out of the 34 women Joseph was sealed to, seven of them were teenagers as young as 14. This is misleading. Only one so, was 14. Uh, <laughs> so it's misleading, but true, is what you're saying there, Kweku. It's, it's misleading, but true. Okay, because one of them was indeed 14 by your own admission. <laughs> Which can seem troubling at first glance, but with deeper investigation, not troubling at all. I'm sorry, are you about to try and make the argument that a 14-year-old girl marrying a 37-year-old man is not troubling? I am very, very interested to see how you make that argument. I'm excited to see how you make that not a troubling thing. You see, reading more than just someone's age can sometimes help you understand the whole picture. Is this the age is just a number argument? <laughs> is that what that is? Her name was Helen Mar Kimball. She was 14, and there is no record or indication of Joseph having sexual relations with her. In fact, Helen wrote, The step I am now taking is for eternity alone, which is a clear declaration of this not being a sexual marriage. It was a ceiling for the next life. Helen actually spent the rest of her life defending the church and polygamy. She was also remarried two years later. So as much as anti-Mormons like to make this about pedophilia, the facts don't line up. The other teenagers Joseph was sealed to shouldn't be viewed through the lens of what we call present presentism okay um right 
It was the 19th century. Sometimes people were married when they were teenagers. Pre uh, yes, sometimes people were married as teenagers in the 19th century, funnily enough to other teenagers, not to men old enough to be their fathers. Presentism is viewing past cultures through the lens of your specific yeah, modern culture and subculture. An example of that is to say, Abraham Lincoln was not for same-sex marriage, he was a homophobe. Well, in his culture, that concept wasn't even Such something people spoke man. about. Judging a 19th century American by 21st century standards is called presentism and makes everyone a villain and leaves their credibility to be sacrificed at the altar of inevitable societal progress. But that's not what we're doing here. We're judging Joseph by the standards of the 19th century. It was no more acceptable then than it is now for a 37-year-old man to marry a 14-year-old girl. And also, just regarding polygamy in general, the state of Illinois had outlawed polygamy in its bigamy laws of 1833. That's two years before Joseph got it on with uh, Fanny Alger, the first of his plural wives. So it's not like polygamy was legal then, but not now. It's always been illegal the entire time Joseph practiced it. It was always frowned upon that he was marrying a 14-year-old girl or entering into any kind of inappropriate relationship with her. Any sort of power relationship with a 14-year-old girl by a 37-year-old man was as frowned on then as it is now. You might be watching this video on an iPhone or MacBook. Well, those products were made by Asian child slave labor in factories. If you buy these products, you're essentially supporting an industry of slavery. Would you want future generations seeing you as nothing but a slave product user? Asian child labor in factories is bad now, right? There are people now that are against it, meaning that those in the future will look back and judge us, but there are people that are judging us now. It's actually the same as polygamy and marrying underage girls. Joseph was judged for it then, and we are judging for him, him for it now. The standards haven't shifted. And also, Kwaku, you were practicing presentism earlier. You were quoting church doctrine on ceilings, which is from the website, which is from the correlation era of the church, but you haven't quoted once DNC 32, which was the scripture available to Joseph at the time. That's what Joseph was working with, but you haven't touched on that because you know it paints a picture that he was going to be having to have sex with these people because he's trying to multiply and replenish the earth, which is God, what God wanted him to do. Uh, moving on. <laughs> Well, if they did, they would be looking at you through the lens of presentism. Joseph marrying 16 or 17 year olds isn't a big deal for the 19th century. It, it was is. a common age that women got married. To Even Helen Mark Himble willingly remarried when she was 16. Okay. If Joseph was a pedophile for this, then so were a ton of men throughout Asia, Europe, whenever, when, who married women in those years. <laughs> so, so the argument there is that if Joseph was bad, then so were lots of other people. It's an appeal to popularity. It's a common logical fallacy. It's saying if loads of people are doing it, it's fine. It's the same thing kids say at school. Everyone else was doing it. But just because loads of people are doing something doesn't make it okay. Oh. The CES letter claims that Joseph married a mother-daughter set and three-daughter set. The fact that Jeremy Reynolds calls them sets is strange enough. No, it's not. It's the English language. A grouping of anything can be described as a set, a pairing, something that comes together is a set. But that's beside the point. He used this to insinuate that Joseph was having sex with him, but provides no evidence. Would no, no, he didn't. From what I remember of the CES letter, he used it to refute the idea of a dynastic sealing, because if you're trying to seal families together in a dynastic way, then why would you marry or be sealed to two members of that family, particularly two generations, mother and daughter? If you're just trying to dynastically seal, why would you do that? That's the point Jeremy Reynolds makes. Which is interesting considering how Jeremy seemed obsessed with evidence until insinuation better serves his arguments. Think about it. If the ceilings were purely for Joseph to have sex, don't you think a mother would complain if he's sleeping with her and her daughter? Would. Joseph was also <laughs> sealed to a 47-year-old, a 50-year-old, a 58-year-old, yes. and a 78-year-old. Yes, so maybe he sexually preyed on young women and the elderly? Well, if the CES letter is making the case that Joseph was a pedophile, it makes sense to leave out the fact that he was sealed to a 78-year-old. Because... But it doesn't leave it out. It's in there. He lists all the plural wives. And they are in there. <laughs> uh, and this is actually a further point against Joseph because it shows he wasn't obeying the commandment of DNC 132, which says he needs to be having children. They need to be virgins. If he's finding a 74-year-old virgin then she's not going to be able to give him children anyway. So either way, he shouldn't have been doing it. He's disobeying God. It hurts the narrative. Maybe he just married her for the cream of wheat and molasses cookies. What? 
It's also important to know that as of today, DNA testing has not found any children between Joseph and any of these other women. Yeah, okay. Right, I know where you're going with this, but there is testimony of someone performing abortions. Hiram Smith gave testimony. So Joseph's brother, Hiram, gave testimony of Dr. John C. Bennett providing abortions. And there are also other testimonies of him providing abortions so that the women, if they were to fall pregnant from their sexual activities with Joseph, wouldn't bear offspring. Directly in contradiction with scripture and with what God has told him to do, but that's what was going on. Joseph and Emma, his first wife, had 11 children. So it's pretty clear that he could make kids. Yeah. That's a less weird way of saying Joseph Smith was fertile. Okay. And as you probably guessed, there was no plan B pill back in the 1840s. I don't know what that is. The letter attempts to make a case that Joseph was sealed to these women without Emma's consent. Well, unfortunately, Emma isn't a reliable witness. She both approved certain sealings and denied it ever happened. It's she was incredibly back and forth on the subject. Okay, so what's a plan B pill? Is that like the... Okay, it's, it's dishonest to make an assumption on her behalf. While trying to paint a false picture of polygamy, the letter ends up confusing two stories in church history. Runnels says that Joseph told the girls an angel with a drawn sword would kill him if they didn't marry him. He never said that. People close to Joseph reported him saying that an angel would smite him if he didn't practice plural marriage. Okay, I don't know about Nobody that. ever claimed that so. he said that to women. If they did, we would have quotes of women saying such. <laughs> we don't. The letter also tries to make a comparison between Warren Jeffs, a convicted pedophile, and Joseph Smith, but the letter fails. How? How does it fail? I've seen that comparison. It's a comparative chart. It just shows two men who practice plural marriage, both of whom entered into such arrangements with underage girls. It's a pretty fair comparison. Just because Warren Jeffs is convicted and Joseph wasn't doesn't mean that their actions were different necessarily if we have evidence that they were, which we do. In summary, the letter is wrong when it states that these marriages were done without consent of the husbands. Records show that this isn't true. The 1887 account by Ruth Sayers is clear that certain men were okay with Joseph being sealed to their wives in the next life. They Again, it, just because they're okay with it, does that make it right? Just because they're okay with Joseph entering into a marriage with a woman who is clearly not a virgin anymore, does that make it okay according to God's law? Well, according to DNC 132, no, it doesn't. I can refute basically all of this with one scripture that you guys are failing to look at. Within the church standard works now, it's there. Maybe you should read it. The CES letter is wrong and misleading. The CES letter can't even stick to a narrative. It says these married women continue to live as husband and wife with their first husband after marrying Joseph. This would insinuate that these marriages were not based around sex. No, actually, it would show that Joseph may have just been having sex with them, but not cohabitating. It actually then all makes it more about sex and less about the other things of marriage, such as division of labor or companionship. But again, the problem here isn't necessarily around whether they give permission or whether Joseph's living with them. The problem here is around the fact that it says in DNC 132, and I will quote it for you. And again, as pertaining to the law of the priesthood, if any man espouse a virgin and decide to espouse another, and the first give her consent, and if he espouse the second and they are virgins and have vowed to no other man, then he is justified. He is not justified if they're not both virgins. And also he's not justified if they don't give permission, although there is a clause later on in the scripture that shows that if they say no, he can basically ignore them anyway. That's, that's another issue. Especially if they were living and sleeping with their first husbands. The CES letter is wrong and misleading. Works. The letter states he was married to a newlywed woman, Zina Huntington, and that she was pregnant. Yeah. However, in 1898, Zina made clear that her marriage to Joseph was a ceiling for the next life. If not refuted, and that she pregnant. ended the marriage with her first husband, Henry, anyway. Still not refuted, the that. CES letter and just is wrong going to end and misleading. It, does that mean Now, it's here's the thing. We're still learning no, new no. things about Joseph Smith's polygamy every year. If we okay. answered every question about Mormon polygamy, Polygamy, we'd have to start a brand new channel called the, something like Holy Shiz. The point is, it's complicated, but the narrative presented to you by the CES letter is nonsense. No, it's not. I think it's wrong and misleading. It we could also call the polygamy show Nabu's Top 100 or <sighs> The Bachelor. A the, the CES letter doesn't represent a narrative. It's not a, it's not a narrative. It lays forth a series of facts and asks a series of questions. So it's not trying to sell you anything. It's just presenting the questions that Jeremy Runnels has and pre presenting the answers he found himself to some of those questions. And the facts that exist, the facts that you yourselves have shared.
1840. We're not even making the claim that Joseph didn't sleep with some of these women. He probably did. <laughs> but the doctrine and practice was not inspired or based on being a sexual deviant. An uncomfortable truth is that if there is no God, polygamy isn't wrong. If there is no God, then marriage is just a short-term contract. And contracts can be reformed. Whether it means two men getting married, or one man and three women, or three women and one man. It's all subjective as long as the parties consent. If there is a God, and the restored gospel of Jesus Christ is true, then that means at certain times God ordains or allows polygamy. Then Can the creator of marriage issue a certain reformation for marriage for a specific where it time doesn't period? Exist. Yes, it's well within God's rights. If there is a God but not the God of our religion, well, the CES letter doesn't care about that debate, so we're not covering it in this series. Polygamy is weird. It makes us uncomfortable because we're not used to it. However, just because something is different oh, doesn't mean it's evil testifying. or even immoral. Just different. The Book of Mormon is true, the church has the authority, go, Joseph Smith was a prophet, and I'm a virgin! What? You see, that's funny, because this this episode was about polygamy, which is, it usually <laughs> involves sex. And it's funny, you see, because get it, I'm a virgin uh, we're explaining uh, sex. My goodness. Right, well, there we are. Um, I hope I've done a good job of at least clearing up some of the logical fallacies there and showing that Jeremy Runnels isn't how they paint him, that his letter is full of quite reasonable questions and reasonable assertions. And... Um, this is my first time doing this, but let me know if you'd like me to do any more. Uh, it's been quite fun. It's been quite difficult to watch this and, you know, try and kind of react to it and and, and pick it apart a little bit and, and maybe try and clear some things up. But, you know, if you would like me to, to do any more, just, just let me know. And um, I will maybe see you guys again. Cheers. Bye now.